All right, now the real project begins. Prep and polishing. So we need to prepare this. There's lots of rubber, lots of plastic on this thing. Uh, so we're gonna prepare it, we're gonna tape it off, prepare it for polishing, uh, and then we're gonna just get to it. I mean, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of paint on this thing, a lot of panels. The nice thing is it's a lot of big, flat, surface panel so we can use uh, we can use you know, if we wanted to we could probably get bigger pads out and work on this thing we'll probably stick with the uh, the five inch six inch face pads but first thing we're going to do is tape and we're going to use this 3m precision uh, so 3m precision is a japanese tape uh, this is uh, i found the, the japanese stuff at uh, esoteric uh, but you'll notice it's sort of translucent the sure. tape uh, it's not uh, you can't you can't contour it, so it won't it won't carry a radius, so it's not stretchy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the beauty of this is just great for polishing. Uh, I find that painters tape um, it won't leave a residue behind, but the painters tape the face of the tape, you know, will kind of pull residue off onto your polishing pad. Where this really won't do that, because painters tape has a bit of texture to it, where this doesn't. You know, you okay. can see it's soft and and uh, simple, and so. They make all different sizes of these, but I like a, a one inch, a two inch, and then a quarter inch. Uh, this very rarely do I use, so one roll of this is all you need in your cabinet. Um, but sometimes, you know, you know, I'd have three or four of these of each of these rolls. That, that you'd use like on expansion joints and some other some other odd areas, like like say on the M3, uh, it has like a little expansion joint on the roof rack rail. Uh, but there's just some areas where you want to cover up where you don't get want the polish to kind of build up in there. That you may need it so rarely on certain cars you need the quarter inch um, but so one roll of that is fine but having a couple rolls of each of these in your cabin is probably a smart thing to have and this stuff is pretty expensive it's like 10 or 12 bucks a roll something like that uh, but we're going to go around and we're going to tape anything that isn't painted you can it doesn't hurt to tape it right. doesn't mean you have to uh, and modern polishes aren't quite as bad as older ones where it would leave real heavy nasty white residue um, but i find you know textured plastic is much more susceptible to getting polish build up and residue and turning white mm -hmm. um, than than rubber wood but you're you're more prone to beat up and damage but really not doing the rubber any service by hitting it with the pad with the pad the other reason to tape off areas like rubbers is then it gets gunk all up in your pad turns it black and then okay. just you know it's just you, you want to keep residue out of the pads as much as possible sure. um, so really a rule of thumb you can use anything shiny you can polish but we are going to polish this area here you can see there's some something I bet you this is tire dressing from the dealer from the previous owner putting that silicone junk on here um, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna just do the polishing won't really change the look of this because it's not shiny but it's going to shine it up a little bit and uh and it's gonna it's going to change the color of this but i'd like to get this stuff out yeah. because we and if it didn't come off in our decon phase i don't think we can try wiping the sound by propyl alcohol but I don't, I don't think that's gonna work so we're gonna tape this we're gonna tape this we're gonna tape this we're gonna tape this we're gonna tape um Let's see, we won't worry about taping the handles. We're gonna tape all this trim. We're gonna tape this trim here. We're not gonna tape this. You know, you can see we're gonna, we're gonna polish this. Uh, we are gonna polish the glass, um, but I tend to do that last. Um, so what we'll do is we'll tape this for polishing the paint, and then we'll re-tape it for polishing the glass. You know, we're gonna tape off all this plastic trim, uh, and so we got a lot of taping to do. We will polish the taillights, but not the headlights. Okay. If it, headlights? headlights have a UV top coat. They have a UV clear coat. As soon as you penetrate that UV clear coat, that's when they turn yellow. That's when they get ruined. Uh, and you can very quickly see when you polish, if you hit the headlights, even with a mild like finishing polish, you can damage the headlights. So we're gonna tape those, but the taillights don't have that same UV top coat generally. Uh, so you can polish the heck out of taillights, but not headlights. Once you polish them once, you gotta basically just sand them, remove that, and then there you're gonna be polishing them all the time. Yeah, so I tend to just buy new headlights, you know, if, if that ever happens. Um, but so, so we wanna tape those off. So let's get rolling, and uh, I'm gonna remove these little grandpa, little cheater things here, this dorky. I'm gonna remove this kind of stuff, and I'm gonna we're gonna kind of go around and de. Uh, we call this the SDR, the slightly douche raptor. You know, so we're gonna we're gonna take another step in slightly less douching it. Step one of douching a raptor is to lift it. You always want to avoid that if you can. Yeah. 
So another thing you could consider doing if you were really particular or you felt like there was lots of residue left over, like if you weren't using DI water and you felt like you had some hard water and it didn't feel clean, um, you could consider using uh, isopropyl alcohol solution like Carpro Eraser uh, prior to polishing. I don't think we need to do that. It feels pretty clean, feels pretty contaminant free. We did use deionized water. We were able to dry it off. I don't feel like there's any soap or any clay bar residue left over, but you may find times if you're really taking your time, you find some there was some residue or it just didn't look clean, then you could always consider, you know, getting you know, using doing a wipe down prior to polishing. But I don't think we need to do this on this. So taping is kind of like uh, it's a lot like um, clay barring, you know, or the auto scrub. We don't have to be like the world's most precise here. But we do want to try to keep it, you know, keep it where you're, you're, you're taping up to an edge. So you see, since it doesn't contour there, I can't like pull it and so I'll just pull off another piece here and kind of do one of these deals. And so this is one of those things you want to get done, but you don't have to like be completely obsessed with the tape because the tape is not staying on there. It's not like we're pinstriping the car forever, you know. We just want the tape to make our life easier and clean up. Sure. We want the tape to make sure that we're not, you know, we're not damaging any any plastics or any any other various areas. So like in here, again, I'm not gonna go crazy to try to get every exact square inch, but you know, I, I wanna try to keep it from covering up the painted surface if I can and cover up as much plastic as I can. Now, if you're really new or if you don't have the precise machines that we have here, the one inch and the three inch and the other two inch size pads, you may want to grab the bigger tape and, and, and tape off a little bit more of this. So in other words, if you're just using a five inch right here. You're probably you going to want to get a bigger piece of wow. tape. Right, right. Wax is way worse than most modern polishes. Most modern polishes have quite a bit of mineral oil in them, so they're pretty oily now. You know, we're, but in the old days, if you would have gotten old school polish on this, it would ruin it. Kevin Brown kind of pioneered all of this in talking about residue, residue control. Because when you're polishing, you're abrading the surface, you're removing material. That material goes somewhere. Well, it goes into your pad. And so if you, the more foreign material you introduce into your pad, the less it works and you may end up with a slightly different result from one panel to the next if your pads all gunked up with junk but you'll see one of the nice things about you know modern detailing is that uh, we're going to coat this thing and so all the trim we're going to be able to pull all this tape off as soon as we're done with the uh, with, uh, with the polishing and all this trim will get done and uh, done in the coating hmm. So this prep just makes it easier during the polishing step. All right, so it's time to start polishing. Uh, let's talk pads, let's talk products, and then we'll get into, into our test spot. Uh, and so I have sort of narrowed this down to the stuff that I use most often. Um, I'm sure there's some things you may want in your arsenal that, um, that maybe would make it a little bit easier, but I find that having these five pad types in your cabinet can solve all the problems. So the workhorse, the cutting pad, the thing you're gonna use most is a microfiber cutting pad from Meguiar's, right? And then I like to use five inch, three inch, and one inch, or the three sizes. Again, it's nice to have two inch, it's nice to have six inch, it's nice to have these other things, but I find myself very rarely if ever using them. In fact, mm. I don't have a six inch backing plate on any of my polishers, so I stick with five inch. Right. So this is what I'm gonna use for aggressive cutting. And then I'm gonna use a, you know, a few different compounds. If I need something really gnarly, I need something really aggressive, 101. Mm. So this is, a, this is actually designed for, uh, for, your, uh, for rotary. It's really what it's designed to be used, rotary and, and, a, and a heavy foam like a wool pad. Uh, but this has been repurposed. Lots of people use this for heavy, heavy cutting. This dusts a lot. Mm. This is a solvent-based 
polish as well. So it's not healthy for you You're to be using this all the time because it's solvent based. Uh, it's not water based. Uh, but this is a, a really heavy, really aggressive. I don't think we're going to need it on this thing. Uh, but you find if you have some really hard paint, like I had to polish my F10 M5, BMW M5, the whole thing with this in order to get any kind of scratch removal. Uh, and so you're going to do that on a microfiber cutting pad and you can use this with a dual action polisher too. So this is the most aggressive. I'm also going to use, so going from most to least, I'm also going to use pretty often. We may or may not use it on this truck, so next Cut Max. Hmm. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of compounds, you know, aggressive polishes out there. Pick a couple of them, you know, and so the ones that I like the most after trying, not all of them, but many of them, uh, is is to have these these two, you know, heavy, more aggressive ones in my cabinet. Uh, so Cut Max is, I would say, more aggressive than my most commonly used, for, which is Jeskar Correction Compound. This is magical. Really? Um, this is my favorite polish on the planet. Um, I use this for correcting more than anything, uh, and I'm using this with a microfiber cutting pad from McGuire and that solves the problem. Now some paints, we'll find out here today, these are two luxury pads that you're probably going to want in your arsenal, but the two luxury pads are Rupes Wool. So the nice thing about wool versus microfiber is wool is doesn't heat up as much. Um, sometimes wool finishes better, sometimes wool cuts more, it just depends on the, on, on the application. But these three compounds I'll use either, let's just, you're just using a three inch, we'll use, so from most aggressive to least aggressive, it's like this. So most, second, and these are sort of interchangeable from an aggression standpoint to least aggressive. And what's the blue? So blue, this is coarse wool. So this is a Rupes wool pad, uh, so this is for cutting. Okay. You know, so this is when this is their most aggressive wool. So you just don't know unless you try. You know, you try different pads, try different, and this is where a test spot comes in. I would say 98% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, I'm just going to grab this and it's going to do the job. My favorite pad, you know, Lake Country makes pads that are cheaper than the Meguiar's. I like these the best. It doesn't have a hole in it. I like the material. They're the pioneers of this. Mm -hmm. Jason Rose, who now works for Rupes, and the team at Meguiar's developed this. So then finishing, finishing you can do several different ways, but I basically end up using one finish polish. It's so next perfect finish. This can also be your one step polish. This is gonna need two steps, I can tell just by walking around it. Um, but if you wanted to do just a nice one step, um, you could use a, a yellow pad like this and just perform a few more passes. Now, this, this, and this. So perfect finish. Correction Compound and Cut Max are all diminishing polishes. So think of it as, you know, Larry from the Ammo NYC talks about this right. often, how it starts as a big pebble, and then as you make successive passes, those pe the, it starts as a boulder, becomes a pebble, or a stone, then becomes a pebble, then becomes a grain of sand by the end of it. So the idea here is that as you make success successive passes, it, it, you know, be, it does less cutting, more finishing. Breaking down, as you correct, go. Correct, correct. So you're breaking down the, 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 the polish. Now, 101, M105, you're, you're used to, um, the, or now, the, now it's 110 and 210 is the new version. Those are, those use SMAT technology. It's not a diminishing polish. It's a different type of uh, compound where it doesn't break down. Mm -hmm. So it maintains the same amount of cutting all the way through. Is there an advantage to that? Or? It's more predictable. Um, this would generally be told, you know, this is for amateurs, they'd say. I sort of gave up on that a while ago and said, you know, it's just it's easier, it works better. I did a lot of A-B testing, you know, 105-205 and 110-210 on, you know, hoods. And me and, uh, and me and Proficient X, Andy Ward and Jason Kilmer sat there and did some A-Bs and they did their... You know, they're non-diminishing, you know, a, a process. They're flying around all over the place and using rotary. And I just did a simple, you know, four passes with correction compound and four passes with perfect finish. And uh, I don't know, you could make an argument back and forth mm -hmm. of which is better. This doesn't dust. It's not solvent-based. It's healthier for you. Uh, it doesn't make a huge mess. It's easier to wipe off. It's a win in all facets. But so in finishing, so kind of sort of completing our discussion here, so perfect finish uh, is your, could be done one step, the yellow pad could be done as your second step with a yellow pad or a white pad. Uh, and so I find myself having five pads in my arsenal. So I've got, just to kind of keep this simple, like this, 
these are the five pads that I use for pretty much everything. And I have them in one inch, two inch, three inch, and five inch. I, just, I have some in here in the cabinet, some six inch pads, which would have a seven inch face, but I don't even, again, I don't even have a, a, an LHR 21 out. Like I don't even have one open with a six inch backing plate on it. I'm doing pretty much every car with a five inch backing plate with a 15 millimeter orbit. And, uh, and I'm using these pads in the three sizes, you know, one inch, three inch, five inch, and then have lots and lots of pads. Yeah. You know, this truck we're probably gonna use, I would guess we're probably gonna use about a dozen of each. But you wanna also develop a good cleaning process where you're cleaning out the pads. Right, blow it out and, or? Well, you know, after you're done and washing them, I mean, you know, to use them again the second right. time. Um, so you have to actually physically wash them and usually use some sort of cleaner, you know, please Dawn or something like that in your, in your in your kitchen sink. So those are the pads we're gonna use. Um, you know, we're probably gonna end up, we're probably not gonna end up using the uh, the wool, uh, we'll see. Uh, and maybe just this paint does fantastically well with the wool, but I think we're gonna end up doing the uh, the yellow, yeah. the yellow and, uh, and we're gonna try it, we're gonna test it. Uh, but we're gonna end up doing microfiber cutting with Jeskar Correction Compound, and we're gonna do the finishing with the yellow pad and perfect finish, which is, almost all of what I do almost all the time. Hmm. So let's talk about machines. Let me get those out. Okay, so let's talk about machines. These are the three. If you're gonna have any three, you're gonna have these three. Other ones are luxury, right? So LHR 15 Mark III, Rupes LHR 15 Mark III, five inch backing place, plate random orbital. I'm a DA guy, dual action polisher guy. The other type of movement would be force rotation. Uh, which uh, think of it, so a random orbital moves and oscillates in all directions randomly. Um, so it moves in a circular fashion, but also in an up, down, left, right, circular fashion as well. Force rotation works at a much smaller orbit, a five millimeter orbit, and it still has a randomness to it, but it operates more in a single plane. Mm. So it's a gear set, gear driven, uh, direct drive type device. The advantage of force rotation versus a dual action polisher is that it's um, more torque. You can lean into it more. It will never stall because it's a gear set. Um, this one will stall if you're not holding it flat. Rotary is certainly useful in a skilled person's hands. Rotary can be more efficient. Rotary can do a better job. Rotary takes years to learn. DA takes hours to learn. Uh, and so I figure, you know, why, why even go there? It's much harder to manage. Um, those who are really proficient with a rotary can do great things. I say uh, it's not, you know, it's not worth my time to do it, to, ch to chase it. I've used a rotary quite a bit, but um, again, I'm a dual action polisher kind of guy. So if you're a DA guy, you're doing LHR 15 Mark III, I like the Flex 3 inch more than the Rupes 3 inch. It has a little bit more torque, feels a little smoother. Uh, it has the, the um, speed control on the top where Rupes is on the bottom. Uh, so this is my favorite 3 inch machine from Flex. Flex is a German manufacturer, Rupes is, a, is an Italian. And then on the 1 inch side, I like, if you have to have one, long neck Nano. Okay. So this is my favorite. This thing does stall a lot. You've got to get used to using it and how, how it works. You're going to use it in rotary mode a lot. Um, but this is the long neck version. Now we're going to use the short neck as well on here. So I like having both. So when we start to get into luxury machines, number one machine, number two machine, number three machine. If you're buying, if you're watching this and you're thinking about buying first, second, third. I would argue stop supporting Chinese intellectual property theft. Stop buying these knockoff machines. You're stealing directly from the companies that have invented this whole thing. It's just not the right thing to do. Just don't do it. Uh, and so don't buy the Adams version. Don't buy the versions that are direct knockoffs. They're just stealing this in China. Don't, don't buy the Mac Shines and all the other goofballs to save yourself 50 bucks. Just don't get it. Get it later. And I know I have a different you know, philosophy on that, but uh, I would argue do the right thing or don't buy it. You know, don't, don't cheat the system. The short neck, one hand operation, long neck, two. 
Hmm. You know, so it's good to have them both because sometimes you got to be like leaning on a panel and you're right. trying to do one hand operation. So uh, I like to have both of these and I use them interchangeably. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll put the uh, dual action on one and the rotary on the other because sometimes if you're, you're using rotary, you might be you, like dual action moves, you know, left and right, up, down. And so you might be smacking into a mm. panel in a tight spot where rotary is direct drive. So it's just spinning. It's not moving up and down. So these you actually can change from rotary to DA. Correct. Rotary to DA. You can also use these as sanders. They give you a sanding backing, uh, a sander in there as well. I'll show you, show you that. Mm -hmm. You can do one inch and two inch. Okay. So you do have the option. They also have an extender on this. I'll show you all the little, all the little tricks of these. Then the other two luxury machines, we're starting to make this transition to battery. Um, this is nice, uh, especially for blowing out pads if you're walking across the, the garage. Um, this is the XFE 15. Uh, and so as you're kind of working your hierarchy, lots of people love this machine. We'll talk about it in a second. But I think this, um, so when I'm buying machines, it's one, two, three, four, five, and then six. So that's my preference of purchase. I like all these. Every time I polish, I have all these out. I do have more machines in the cabinet here. I have the pneumatic version, which we won't use because I don't have my airlines in yet. Another thing you're gonna want is a tornador. So this has a little thingy in here that creates some randomness to the airflow for blowing out your pads. Right. So we're gonna hang this on the door outside because I'm, you know, I want to keep my place clean. Trunk pops so you can when we're polishing on the edge of a door, we we'll use this to prop the door open. So we'll probably use these as well. Um, but that's pretty much it. We're gonna use the machines, we're gonna use the pads, we're gonna use the polish, we're gonna figure out what works. Two more things. So you asked me about this earlier about scan grip and using tripods and using rolling stands and putting the scan grip lights, either fixing them to the wall. I always have great intentions with scan grip. You know, I set it up on this quarter panel and next thing I know I'm on the rear deck of the, you know, the car and, and I haven't moved the light. It's still sitting on the front quarter panel. Um, so I find that I put a, this is a uh, Sunmatch 3. I put this in my pocket. This has five color modes. So it goes from 2,500 to 6,500 Kelvin. On this truck, we're gonna experiment with what color works best. Probably something in the middle on this gray paint will probably be the right color temp to use to see best. Uh, on a white car, you'd use a low color temp, like 2,500 or 3,500. On a black car, you'd probably wanna use a cooler, like 6,500. So this, we're probably gonna be, you know, maybe 5,500 or something like that. And here's a brand new tool, which I wasn't super thrilled about. I didn't think that they could pull this off as Milwaukee. Uh, so Milwaukee's come out with a detailer's light. This is a brand new, just, I don't think it's available yet. They sent me one of them that are, they're starting to launch these. Um, but this is the Milwaukee version that has the same color temp adjustability. Uh, what I found, we'll talk about this as we're using them. What I found is that uh, this is a better straight on light. This is a better, you know, 45 off access light uh, because of the conical nature and then this ring around that kind of blocks the light from you looking directly into it. Uh, where if you try to do that with this, you tend to flash yourself in the eye. Uh, but the advantage of this is you can use the Milwaukee ecosystem. You can use the Milwaukee batteries. And so Milwaukee has made a commitment to professional detailing. Uh, and so they've, um, this is supposedly a 98 CRI LED, a very expensive, very high quality LED. The first step in polishing is to perform a test spot. You need to figure out what's going to work. This is how you figure out the paint's hard or soft. You know what I'm always talking about? Is it soft paint? Is it hard paint? Who cares? Yeah. Let's just figure out what works. Um, and uh, and you know, you, everybody has a different def definition of what's hard or soft. Not really something we can measure. I'm not a big proponent of using um, paint depth gauges and measurement tools. A couple of reasons. Uh, they're not very accurate. Uh, I've got old, I've got a three thousand dollar Defel Defelsco over there. We can grab if we want. But I, I know this is a new truck. I mean, it's probably been polished on once, if ever. Um, I'm not concerned about blowing through the clear coat, especially using our dual action polishers and using, you know, correction compound and a microfiber cutting pad. But you could, if you really want to get into it, you could get into paint depth gauges. The reason, the other reason why I don't love them is. We don't, you, even the one that has the, the, that measures and tells you the three layers of paint, it's still not 100% accurate. You don't know where the failure point is until you failed. Mm. You, know, you don't know until, until it blows through the clear. Yeah, see, I think I can see best here, right around mid-tier. So right around, you know, 3,500 or 4,500 on this gray paint. Mm. I like 4,500 on this, I think. So. What I'm going to look for is, 
imperfections. You notice anything here on this one? A lot of squirrels. So that's holograms. That's from a rotary. Mm. So that what you're seeing there are holograms, which uh, a swirl mark would be a deeper scratch. Okay. This is a clearly induced mark from a uh, from a rotary, mm. and so this one I feel like is a better straight on light, and I like running the Milwaukee at the lowest output mode. Mm. So let's do since we know we got some holograms here, let's do this section here, mm. and we'll see what works. So I'm going to start with. I, you always want to start least aggressive, so you theoretically should start with your finishing pad and finishing combo and see how it goes. I know that's not going to work yeah. on this. You know, this, is the, this truck hasn't been polished, hasn't been corrected. We just rubbed on it a bunch doing the, doing the, um, the, the, the decon stage. So I know that we're going to have to do some work to get this thing polished up. So this is going to be a two-step thing. That just comes from trying. But theoretically, if you were starting from scratch and you really wanted to do it to the textbook correct, uh, you should start with least aggressive and work your way down. Um, I just know from experience that we're going to need to at least, I'm hoping, Jeskar correction compound and a microfiber cutting pad is going to be good to go. So just to make this nice and simple, let's grab our cordless. This is where the cordless can really come in handy. It's nice to have. I'm going to put my pad on straight. Another thing you want to do, which I didn't do to this, but which will aid you, is you want to put a line on here so you can tell when it's spinning. This one's pretty easy to see when it's not. I'm going to take a black marker, take this back off. Because this has to be rotating in order to be most efficient, it'll still be doing some work if it's not. If it's, so if it's oscillating but not rotating, uh, so if it stops rotating, it still works a little bit, but not nearly as effectively. So I'm just going to make a line like that. So the mark so will just tell us if it's not rotating. If it's stopped. correct, okay. correct. So now you can argue back and forth on this about whether this needs to be done or doesn't need to be done, uh, but, but I think you should prime the pad. It certainly right. can't hurt. You should always shake your product. So make sure you shake it really well in the beginning. Another thing that can make your process a little bit uh, more efficient is to use these Meguiar's bottles. I don't know why I don't sell these. I probably should. Uh, but these are like the self-cleaning uh, type type of bottle as well. But you can use these things, which are super helpful if you're doing a lot of polishing. And then I'm going to take my pad and I'm going to just try to coat it. I'm trying to cover as much as possible. Like so. And the idea you and just want to saturate you take this. the fibers. Correct, so correct. You, know, you, you just, theoretically, the theory is that you don't want dry fibers, dry microfibers on the surface. Okay. Now, I've done it without doing this, and I honestly feel like it does the same thing, but I'm just going with the experts here and saying, you know, it seems to be a decent thing to do. Certainly can't hurt. You got that, Mike? A nice, simple little two dots. I'm going to run this at six. Let's check our battery. Battery's only at two. Let's change our battery out. So I'm going to do just a two by two. So I'm going to take a two foot by two foot section, 18 inch by 18 inch section, something like that. And I want to keep the pad flat. And so this is where, this is always a difficult thing for me, um, is that I tend to drive, I want to drive with my, with my follow hand, with my left hand. You want to drive the polisher. Uh, this kind of can steer, uh, but you want to do most of your steering with your lead hand, the hand that's on the front of the machine here. Mm. Uh, because what, when you drive with this, you tend to lift either this way or that way. Mm -hmm. And when the pad isn't flat, you're not really doing a whole heck of a lot, and it will also cause this thing to stop spinning, right. especially this machine, <laughs> uh, because it, um, you know, it doesn't have a lot of power. So I'm gonna start, spread the product around. And so I'm driving with this left hand, pushing down on the surface. So see the pad, the pad will stop spinning there. All right, so I want to make sure it's spinning. And the way to do that is to make sure it's flat. And then one rule of thumb is I could make four passes. 
so I can make crosshats. So one way you can do it to stay organized is to go like this. Making overlaps. So that would be one pass. This would be two. That's two. And then we do three. Now I'm not going like this. I'm keeping the machine nice, slow, controlled. That's full. A really good habit to develop is checking your towels before using them. Just check to make sure there aren't like sand spurs or something stuck in there. You guys don't have those in full in Georgia, but I'm gonna take my towel, wipe it. I don't really have much to say about wiping, just freaking wipe it. But you could fold it in eighths if you want or whatever you whatever works for you. I wouldn't say got everything, but it's a huge difference. So now here comes the conundrum. Mm -hmm. Do you want everything? Or do you want Leave clear. imperceivable from here, right? Yeah. What do you want? You know, this is a stiffer pad than the white pad. Um, I find that the less deflection that you get from a yellow pad, a lot of times, oftentimes, will finish nicer. Hmm. It'll finish better. You can prime two ways. You can prime this way by buttering it, or you can prime on the fly by, by putting double dots, putting it on the thing and getting it spreading rotating, it out, right. spreading around and then adding some more. I like to prime this way. I like to butter it. A couple of dots. I don't know if I have enough slack here. I shorten my power cord. Two important things to have. You got the, uh, the octopus and the uh, pro lock cord. So this thing is cool because as soon as I put this on, locks. Oh, nice. Especially useful for polishing. And then four locking ends on this side. Speed four is the sort of working speed, the recommended speed for this. Spread the product around, then make your pass. Remember, I'm driving with this hand. If I come up here, stop spinning. Start spinning, no more spinning. So it's still oscillating, but it stops spinning. Was our four passes. Now, one of the things that's not very fun about the Jess Car perfect finish combination is there's not a remarkable difference between finished and unfinished because Jessgar does such a good job of diminishing down and creating a you know really nice finish but that's going to be our ticket if this is my m3 i'm going to be like looking at every square inch i'm going to be spot treating and getting every little scratch and things out but on my truck i'm going to do these two sets of successive passes we probably could have gotten away with just leaving you in one one step you know, with just car and microfiber and call it a day. But I think that the way to, to, to do this, you know, decently is to do, do it like that. So that's our test spot. So now we know largely on this thing that this process is going to work. So I got my tornador, which that little pin spins around. I've got, I don't have a regulator on my compressor yet, so this is too much pressure, but you know, it's not gonna hurt anything. It's, a, it's like 150 PSI or something like that. You really only need like 90, so it's a little loud. But all I wanna do is hold this out the door. You know, you know as you get my blown out here, you're good. And then. Now 
my pad's fresh and ready to add some more pot product to it. Pretty simple. So think about this. So see how the pad, the pad is actually outside the backing plate. Mm -hmm. So this part of the pad is not doing any work. And you're gonna notice this when you're polishing. So you're gonna be thinking, well, you know, if I bring the pad up to the edge, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna be polishing the edge. Well, then you're gonna miss the edge because really the yeah. work happens on the, the edge of the backing plate, plate and you'll be able to see it. Uh, and so when we're doing our edge work and we're worrying about this kind of thing here, you know, I'm gonna kind of rock up into here. This is where your follow hand comes in. Your lead hand is applying the pressure and your follow hand is just kind of working. You can come and work it from this way and that way. Uh, and knowing that most of the work, you know, especially on the edges of these things is gonna be done by the edge of the, edge of the, um, the backing plate, not the edge of the pad. So set the polisher up, just set it on the paint first. Another thing you could do if you're like working on a panel is you could always just kind of glob it around just so you're not, you know, you know. Especially if you put too much on it. Yeah, yeah. And so then here, now we don't have to worry about it too much, but one trick I learned is take the cord and put it over your back. Right. Like that, right? It's so now it's managed. Okay. Are you left or your righty? Right. So your left hand would be on the front. Okay like that. All right. So now think about this when you're transferring, oh, we're super high here and making it hard for you. So when you're, when the, the weight of your heel of your hand is in the polisher. So I'm going to hold here and my heel of my hand here through my thumb is what's kind of applying the pressure. Okay. And you want to think about, you know, you're applying it, you know, there's a decent amount of pressure, you know, now be careful in the center of things. This is pretty well braced, but like, like the center of like a, a roof on an M3 is kind of, it's kind of soft. You don't want to dent mm -hmm. it, uh, but you can apply some, some pressure, you know, especially as much torque as this machine has. Uh, and so my lead hand, I usually have my three fingers here. Uh, my top finger in the front and I'm kind of leaning like this the power cords over my shoulder And then this is just a guide, you know, you don't want to be lifting up and down with this This is just kind of smooth. You're really driving this through your palm through the, like this this heel of your palm right at your thumb hmm. And it takes time to get used to to make it smooth you know, right. Shoot for years. I couldn't get the darn thing flat to save my life so the other thing I forgot to mention is there's a uh, uh, once you get it started, mm. clip that in and then the cool. machine will run. There you go. Just spread it around. Good. Now you're going to make your passes. Nice, slow, and controlled. So see what's happening here? It's causing the machine to stop. See how it stalls? So you have to kind of manage the weight of the machine. Good, nice and flat. Remember, this hand is just guiding all your pressures up here. Nice, a bit. Nice and flat. So now this edge here, this is where you want to look. See that backing plate? You can see the backing plate. You want to get the backing plate up to the edge of this, not rolling over it in order to get that edge. You're gonna have to rock up into that. So this hand here, when you tend to come up on top, you tend to, you know, you tend to rock here as you go forward and then as you come back, you tend to rock forward. Mm. You know, and so you really wanna drive it with, with this hand. And so you see the edge right here? See how I'm bringing that up right to the edge? That means that I'm getting the edge. And you can scrub this, like you can come up like this. Now see how you went too far up there? You hit that. So I want to come up here. It's hard because it's tall. Now I want to come up and I want to scrub this. See how I'm taking the machine like this? And I can do whatever I need to do to get in there. It, I, could, I don't have to go, I can go this way. I can go this way up and back four times. It just helps to keep track when you do the cross hatching. So then I come down. And so then this here, I could go like this. My hand's not even on it. The pad doesn't have any choice but to be flat. As soon as I do this, see what happens? As soon as I do this, 
where I'm driving with this hand. But this is just here for support, moral support. Think of it like that. Nice and smooth. So I'm watching my edge here, because if I come over like this, I'm missing, I'm missing that little dip. So that's why when I'm doing edges, I wanna make sure I come up to it like that. We're gonna get into that when we do like, when we do like the, the, the small machine. All right, let's check your work. It's pretty good. So if you think about when you bring a pad over top of an edge, it's just not doing anything. All it's doing is hitting your edge. And so that, that time, you wanna figure out a way around that. You know, you, you're gonna have to come up over this edge with the face of the pad, this is inevitable. Right. But that time you're doing that is doing nothing but pounding this section here. Yeah. So I wanna spend my time manipulating the machine to scrub around and not try to get, yeah, try to get as much as I can. Yeah. So one little trick you can do, okay, where was that scratch? It's right here. So I can just pop the polish right there. So I marked it. There's a little bit of pitting and stuff, some from rocks and things like that, nothing I'm gonna get out. But if I wanted to try to get those scratches, I could take a smaller machine like this. This is often what I would do. Prime the pad. A little bit extra on there. This is dual action, this is what I have set up on here. And then I'm gonna try to... Speed is like in your gut, you know? You just kinda know, you kinda learn how much is too much, how much is too little. i wipe that. So what were you running that on? What speed were you on there? I was on like three and a half. You get them? Made some improvements. See, they're right here. Yeah. And I could always try. Rubbing a little bit more. What, what a lot of like, if you really get, you know, full pro, you know, you, where you're really doing some high level corrections, you'd probably go around, you'd hit all of this stuff with a, with a one inch, all the areas that are difficult mm -hmm. and really work and concentrate on edges. I just don't see edges as that important, you know, but edges are where you can get a lot of hazing, a lot of scratches and things. And so a lot of guys will go around with this, tooth, this toothbrush and brush, you know, and get all the little edges and get all the little detail and then come back and hit the bulk area. You just just develop your process. Mine, I like to do the bulk, the big, and then kind of spot treat whenever I need to. Pea-sized dots. Get there. Yeah, not lima beans, peas. I don't know where do you grow your peas at. All right. Get the cord up over your shoulder. Spread it around. So now do that same kind of thing where you want to make sure your pad is contacting the paint when you're working the edge. So when you're doing this one here, making sure that you want to focus on keeping the pad in contact. So get in closer to the machine. Get your chest in there, turn this hand over. Put this over the shoulder like this. Get this hand over here like this. There you go. Remembering everything from here. Yeah. So you're working the manipulate and keep the machine spinning. Keep it on the surface. Trying to get think about it. I want to get that little little divot there. You know, I want to get that little crevice, but I don't want to blow through the top. So when you're thinking about like this here, you're thinking about your attack. You know, I want to get in from this angle 
and I want to get in from that. You know, I want to get this whole this whole valley. And so as you're thinking about, you know, getting the pattern, or what do I need to do to keep this thing freaking spinning, right. not jamming into it this way, you know, so that's where the little little rock, little scoop comes in. Mm. Same thing where I scoop the opposite, where I'm not just parking it on top of here. Right. So I need to scoop this, I need to scrub that, I need to make sure I'm watching my pad edge, uh, you know, on here so I can get to the edge of this so I'm not just rolling it over. And Because if you think about it, when the pad rolls over, it misses this whole section here. Right. So when you take the whole pad, and that's why it's important that you bring the pad up to the edge. Right. I could go, I could grab one of one, I could go at it, you know, there's another one here, there's another one there. These are, these are scratches from likely a piece of dirt and aggressive mm. washing. You know, that's what those scratches generally come from, is uh, when you're ch chasing bugs, you're like, eh, I'm kind of doing this, and you get a little piece of sand particle, and makes a scratch and I know we could get these out I just don't care that much you know I don't I don't want it to be I don't want to I care more about the the level of, and the amount of paint that I have on this thing than I do getting that scratch out sure. knowing farewell I'm gonna have a million of them all throughout this whole vehicle knowing that I could also consider switching up and doing a more aggressive polish on the whole thing and it could probably pull more of those out in those initial passes that's another thing you consider but then, but then you're removing more paint more clear coat off. correct correct so i and i mean i don't know about you but i think that's pretty acceptable when you do an area like that matt are you like are you going to feather that out as you go no no because this is not removing or not changing any texture it's not like sanding okay so you cannot remove texture you know uh, orange peel right you cannot remove texture with a polishing pad right. Just can't do it. The only type of pad that would do that would be a, a rayon, a, a, not rayon, a um, denim pad. Mm. Uh, denim pads generate lots of heat. They can actually remove some texture. Wow. Uh, but we're not removing texture when we're polishing because this is, you know, this is kind of uh, the, because there's there's foam here. The foam doesn't allow the texture to be removed. Uh, and so because we're going to finish polish, even if there's a little more haze, the finish polish is going to take care of that. Right. Sure. And now is where you definitely see the haze that we just left in it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yep. even though it's it's not bad, if you look closely, you see the haze. Correct. And then that's why we're two-stepping. Right. But, you know, if you showed this, if some, you know, if a customer came in and you showed them and they kind of, you know, after you wiped this out with alcohol and they right. went like this, and you said, look at this versus look at that, and they'd be like, oh my gosh, it's perfect. Yeah. You and I can see the cloudiness right. in there. Uh, and so that's where, uh, that's where the finishing part comes in. So dig into that sucker, get it in there. Slop it around like you're buttering the uh, the first layer of the bread underneath, not just the just not the top. That's yeah, good. Don't butter it like Michelle butters toast and misses half of it. You want to get the whole darn thing. So just a little bit, two little pea size. Yep, good, good. Now this is one of those spots you're gonna fling it everywhere if you don't kind of spread it around. So just put the pad face on here and just kind of smear it around on there, and it'll save you some trouble. So speed on this four as well. But before you turn that sucker on, smear it around the edge so you don't fling it all over yourself and all over the everything. Good. Keep the thing nice and flat as you turn it on. Spread it around. So you got to push it from the back. Mm. Yep. So it's, you kind of thumb into it and lock it in. You can let go of that. There you go. Now, you went a little more speed, bring it up to like four and a four and almost five. There you go. Now, same thing. Flip around. Left hand, like this. And get in there. You know, get this sucker, like get your elbow in your body. And I want to get in here like this. And look down on it. It'll save your back too from having to be all out like this forever. You're gonna kill your back. So this is one of those things where you remember, so right now the pad is not getting the edge. So you want to get right up to the edge of the backing plate. So that's why you want to get over top of it. And you want to look at the backing plate 
and you want that to, there you go. See what I'm saying? Yeah. See how the edge of the pad, you're getting right up the edge. And you kind of need to scrub up next to it. And you need to do the same thing on this edge as well. See, right now you're going over the edge. You're just hitting the peak. So you want to take the thing like this. So I'm going to turn it because I can't see it here because this is in the way. So I'm going to turn it and I'm going to follow this. See, because right here, this isn't working. This is just hitting the peak. So it's missing this part and this part because we're over top. And so what I want to do Sometimes I got to get my hand out of the way, you know, just so I can I can contort my body to get in there, get that edge. Then I'm going to come up here, flip it around, see, because I don't want to do this. I will do that at the end, just kind of, just kind of, yeah. But I want to do this where I'm coming up to it. And see, because it's round, I need to kind of scoop into it. I need to I need to scrub into it, but I'm keeping it flat. Not this, this. I've got a little bit of weight, sort of a little bit lean. If I lean it too much, it'll stop spinning. But a little bit leaned into it. And then I come down here, and I'm leaning this, this edge into it. Notice I'm managing because it wants to stall on me, so I have to adjust. It's stalling on me because I'm coming back like this a little bit too much. So I need to get it back flat. And then I would come back and do the whole thing like this. Try to keep this thing rotating. I sit like this, so if I park it right here, it's polishing right there and right there. Yeah. Versus I need to kind of figure out, it's not an easy place to get. I gotta figure out how am I gonna get this freaking thing in there and have it still spin. And then how do I get up in there? Knowing that I can get to about here, but then it kind of comes up on edge, and so then I know I need to come back this way and get it that way. Just thinking about those little kind of things. I mean, it's, this is just comes from time under the machine, you know, just time under the machine. I learned a lot of this edge work stuff from Jason mm -hmm. Rose and Todd Cooper writer about, you know, in my, when before I had really spent a lot of time with them, I was more of just a, you know, just get the get the bulk of the thing done, and I just never really looked at edges. I just didn't look at how they, you know, how they how they were performing. Or just avoid them. Yeah, yeah. You just kind of come up on them and just, you know, just not. I knew that I didn't need to. I didn't want to park my machine on here, but I knew that also that um, that I, I didn't know that you know I have to come up to the edge of these and and these are rounded, so not as big of a deal. So I'm kind of using this, but this edge isn't as important because even though we are rolling over, it's still getting most of it. Mm -hmm. But like the edge of the door, or like the edge of here, these edge of these panels. It's, you know, if you don't, if you roll over, it doesn't do any good. It just, it just cups it. So like this edge here, we're going to actually pop this open. We're going to put one of those props in uh, so we can come up to the edge. But your tendency is just put the pad and just roll over it. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're on this edge here with a pad, actually, let me pop this and I'll show. So check out how nifty this little puppy is. So now we're locked in like that. Wow. Right. So. If I have my polisher and I'm over here and I'm trying to get the edge. So what's happening here, and it's hard to see because the pad is, is kind of, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's crunching here. But what's happening as I roll over the edge, my pad is not contacting the one place I'm trying to get. Mm. It's contacting all on the peak. Uh, and so that's why I need to stop the pad right where the edge of the backing plate is because I want the pressure to be right on the edge, like right on this tip here. So now, a couple little, couple little tips. Since we're using a diminishing polish, what you did is you spread it around here and you worked it a couple of passes and then you brought it over here. Mm -hmm. 
this is nitpicking, but theoretically, you've already broken down the polish. So theoretically, this didn't get cut mm. as much as that got cut because yeah. you moved some broken down polish. Sure, 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 sure. So that's the theory behind, oh, I think this is minimal, but that's the theory behind spreading it around your entire section so that way I get fresh, yeah. undiminished polish, and then as I work it, I come, come through. So here's a good example. You see your passes here. So what happens is, you didn't, this is correct, I didn't do anything wrong here, but so the microfiber, when you, when, if you came and just pounded it in here, mm -hmm. then you're going to dig into this edge, right? And so that's where that kind of curve. Sweet. And so when you're, when you're, when you're scooping here, you're kind of able to get, you know, this, th this section doesn't get polished great, but this one does. Mm. And then when you come up this way, right. you know, this section doesn't get polished great, but, but this yeah, one yeah. does. And so you're kind of hitting it from both yeah, angles yeah, yeah. and you're kind of taking out your tick marks from your microfiber. Hmm. Let's see if we have any ticks here. Be hard to see on this. So what can happen on really soft paints is when you bring that into this, you'll see like the microfiber, and I don't see any of that there. Yeah, there's some water etching on here, which is probably not going to come out. Mm. So just as an aside here with water spots, water spots are a chemical etching. Right. Generally what happens with the water spot is the, um, you get some mineral content in water, you know, this heats up, the paint swells or opens up. So let's think of your pores open up, mm. the chemical gets down in it. When it cools off, the pores grab and they hold on to the, to the, to the, to the, to the water spot. Wow. And so to get those water spots out, sometimes you can throw a chemical on it and it'll remove them off. Most, I find that most of the time that doesn't work. And so what you could do theoretically is we need to try to restore the conditions that created this. We need to heat it up to roughly the same temperature that caused the stuff to go in there, uh, which is a nightmare because then you almost heat it and you almost, I've, I've I popped the paint on the rear bumper of my M3 before where I was trying to get the water spots out and overheated just to, in a split second, just flashed, because that, that section was repainted. So I think we just deal with that yeah. water spot. Mm. Like, I don't think we can try again. We can try spot treating again, but I don't think that's coming out without some really aggressive stuff. The other thing that's fickle about water spots is that I may heat up with the polish, mm -hmm. they disappear, and they come back three days later. Really? Yeah, wow. that's a real well, freaking buzzkill. Yeah. When we go back here and we coat the darn thing after it's finished polish and you're like wow you know it's gonna be incredible well, if you're like this then you know of course you can continue to go on forever let's see the, let's see what happens with this scratch here you guys see that scratch on camera no <laughs> there's a scratch right here real big deep scratch all the way down the, all the way down the thing um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to treat this section because like this is kind of far away from me mm -hmm. so i'm going to come up to here and i'm going to get on a ladder and i'm going to put like a three and you know, probably one inch this section right here right. is how i would how i would tackle that So there's still the heads of the water spot. But it got rid of a lot more of the water spots than what the correction compound was doing. Okay, time to do some glass. So glass is not, glass is not about polishing. So we're not polishing the glass, we're just deep cleaning, right? So we're just using this microfiber cutting pad with whatever was on it before. I'm just gonna throw some cut max on here. And I did the other windows over there earlier. You could do it with the larger polisher. This, just so I can get in all the crevices, I'm gonna do the three inch. What you could do is you could three inch around and then get rather bigger polish. I'm just gonna do the whole thing with the Rupus three inch here. So I'm not attempting to, like there's some scratches in here. What tends to happen with side windows is you'll get dirt or sand in here, and then when you dry, put the window down, then it'll scratch it. You can't get those scratches out. It's just, they're just not coming out. You could sit there with CarPro Siri glass and try to polish until you're blue in the face. You know, you might be able to improve them a little bit, but after hours and hours of work. So I look at this as I just want to prep this, get all the, any deeper embedded contaminants, gunk that didn't come off in the, uh, in the, um, the decon phase, and just get it out. I'm going to use a little bit more polish than I normally would. 
and I'm gonna run this thing as fast as it'll go because it can't really hurt the glass. Up to speed six. The other thing I'll do is grab a little bit of a uh, little bit of eraser just to get this off. I'm gonna we're gonna do a deep cleaning before or before we do our coating and all that stuff. But all this is doing here is setting me up for my glass sealant to ensure that the sealant's gonna hold up better. So it's just I look at this as just a deep, deep, deep cleaning. It'll remove a lot of like the uh, water spotting and things that you tend to get on glass over time and just make your glass nice and slick and prepared. You see, I got lazy here and there's some tape that's, that's covering, but if my glass was really bad or I'd just never been polished, like this is pretty, a pretty new truck, I would probably do a little bit more, more specific taping, but uh, where I, you know, where I retape this and, you know, pulled the tape to, to this edge but again the glass isn't remarkably marred or contaminated so we'll get into later in the process of uh, of doing the the actual you know coating of the glass and preparing the glass for coating uh, but I always do this part in this like this in this part of the process I'm compounding paint's all covered in compound anyway so I just want to knock out the glass we already did the back we did the windshield, you treat them all the same. I actually do the glass on here as well. So I'm gonna do that same process to this glass and this and the windshield and the back and the other side. And then the glass is prepared and ready to go. All right, let's do this trim here. So what this marring, there's straight line scratches. Well, that comes from two things, aggressive washing and detail spray. Mm. You know, people like to, especially a douche truck like this, would have someone who kind of cares about it, right? So the guy who bought it first cared about the truck and, um, but didn't know what he's doing. Right. And so this kind of vehicle would get dry wiped all the time, detail right. spray wiped all the time, I'm telling people, just throw your freaking detail spray away. The only time you're ever gonna dry wipe is if you're gonna do a rinseless wash N914 and you're gonna soak the crap out of it. And I would actually recommend, actually you would call that a waterless wash, I'd recommend you do a rinseless wash with a bucket of water at the, at the minimum. You probably, if you don't have a lot of experience, you would probably want to go to foam and try and see how that works. I can tell that wasn't going to work, uh, but I don't want to go to cut max. So I'm going to do a correction compound microfiber cutting pad. This pad looks dirty because this will remove some black from this. Some, 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 there must be a, like a tinted, whatever this clear coat or whatever the heck they put on this shadow line stuff. Right. That's what BMW calls. I'm going to do one at a time too. Slow it down about speed four. But I don't really need to treat this much differently than paint. Than the paint on the rest of the car. So notice I opened the door there, but I didn't on the other side. And you can see this here. This is what I'm always assessing. So what do you see? You see this door sticks out like it did this, there, you know, you'd be slamming into the edge of that. Right, so this, the reason why I didn't open this door to get out of the way is because that pad is not slamming into the edge of this because this is sitting back further than that, right? right? And so if I was trying to get up to this edge, guess what I'm doing, this soft area, I'm smacking into that. And so you just use your judgment as you're kind of working a car. Same thing here, you know, I would certainly want to open this door if I'm trying to get this edge here. So this will, there's a little bit of haze in here still, but it's finished down really nicely. I mean, from here, it's freaking perfect. 
Okay, so let's talk finishing. Uh, so we're gonna use Rupezi Gallo. You could use white, you could play with. We Remember we did our test panel when we first started, so we know it's gonna work. Uh, and this gray paint, you know, there's not a, it's, it's, it's dark enough to where it matters, but it's not so dark that like you can see every little tick mark or imperfection or haze. Uh, so we're not gonna see like a remarkable difference in outcome here. Make sure you shake this stuff up really well. This is a diminishing polish. Remember we talked about the, the pebble analogy that Larry Cosilla talks about. And so it breaks down as you, as you, as you do the process. So I'm gonna prime the pad. You can, again, you can, well, let me show you priming because we already showed you the regular, um, the regular buttering method. So let's prime on the fly. Put four pea-sized dots. I'm gonna prime it on my panel. So I'm gonna go to speed three. Hold it in place. I'm gonna rotate it around a little bit. Check it, so it needs some more. You know, it hasn't quite gotten all over everything. A couple more dots. Pretty well primed, good to go. So that's priming on the fly. Because remember, we have a diminishing polish. This, I think, matters a little bit more on finishing. We want to have an equal or even result throughout the vehicle, so I broke down some of that, so now I want to start fresh. So I want some fresh, Polish, two piece size dots. I'm gonna go back up to, on this machine, back up to normal speed before four on the Rupes Mark III, six on this. Now, I'm gonna make less passes. I'll probably do three sets of passes on this. Okay. You know, you just kind of get your internal clock going. And um, one thing you don't have to worry about, you don't really have to obsess over edges. Right. You know, edge work is done in compounding, so your edges should be finished pretty nicely. We're just jeweling up the surface. Yeah. So we're no longer micromanaging, we're no longer looking for scratch removal. We've done all of the doing that's gonna be done, right? Now we're just kind of jeweling it up. And so I can move, you know, quite a bit quicker. Finished polishing takes a lot less time. And spread it around. Notice I'm, I'm, I, I usually pick up my pace maybe of like a beat, mm -hmm. beat and a half, you know, I'm, I'm moving a little bit quicker. Right. But you don't want to get so quick that you're just moving, you know, again, we're not applying a wax here. We're like, we're braiding the surface. We are, we are polishing. And so to all polish, to do polishing, we need to remove material and to remove material, we need time and heat, you know, time and friction. But when it's all done and the thing's all jeweled up and all nice and finished and we're prepped and ready to do our, our coating, um, it'll, it'll be worth the effort, you know, worth right. the result. Sure. And so we're gonna go around the whole thing and that's what we gotta do. Now we don't have to do that to the glass because remember the glass we weren't polishing, the glass we were just cleaning. Yeah. So all we, all we have to do is go around and hit all the surfaces. We won't need to hit this either you know, because we didn't really polish this. We were just trying to get that silicone crap off of the off of here. Okay. So we just need to go hit the painted surfaces. You can do a little bit larger section than we did when compounding, but section it off. So notice I didn't run it down to here. So I'd, I'd treat this as a section. Right. I'm gonna split the door into, into you know, probably maybe three sections. And uh, so I'm gonna do maybe, maybe when I was doing like 18 by 18, I'm gonna do 24 by 24 inch sections oh, when, I'm doing, when I'm doing you know, finishing. Okay. All right, everybody, that's a wrap on polishing. Uh, next step will be to remove all the tape and then start preparing for a coating that'll be, you know, next, the next step. But uh, this truck, two-stage, two-step, uh, jeweled up really nicely, cleaned up the paint quite a bit, removed quite a bit of scratches, removed some contamination from the glass, uh, and it always feels good to get this part done. This is the lion's share of your detailing uh, pursuit is the paint correction part of it. Uh, but we still have to do the interior, we still have to do coating to, to seal the glass. I'm gonna go as far as taking the wheels off and dressing those up and uh, painting the calipers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the correction part of it is one of the most satisfying. This is the part that makes it shine. You know, this is where you get your gloss. This is where you get your detail from. Uh, this is where you get you know, your money's worth if you're ever gonna pay anybody to detail your vehicle. So that's a wrap on polishing. We'll see you uh, on coating.